Well, good morning again. You know, when Denise and I moved to Colorado a year ago, we didn't realize how many friends we have in other places besides Denver, Colorado. And in the last year, we now realize how blessed we are to have so many friends. And you know how I know how blessed we are to have so many friends? They call us going, can we come stay with you? And can you take care of us for the weekend? So we have become an Airbnb. In fact, we have some great friends of ours, the Myers right over there, that we're showing them around. And so one of the things when people come into town, I feel the pressure like I'm this tour guide, right? I got to take them to places. And I start thinking to myself, what's the different points of interest? If you're the first time to ever visit the Denver area, what's the points of interest that would be a good place to take them? So let me just share a few of the points of interest where I take people and see if you might want to add or detract from this, I always say we have to take them first to the first thing they have to do is the Garden of the Gods. Okay, just those beautiful rock formations. Here's the good thing too, it takes an hour and a half to get there and an hour and a half to get back there, so we kind of waste some time of trying to do other things in there. But points of interest, the Garden of Gods. The second thing we always try to t make sure they see is the evil blue Bronco when you come and go out of the Denver airport, right? And like, we love to take them at night going, the people in Denver are evil, look at the eyes of that Bronco there. The third thing that we always have to make sure they go see is the troll up in Breckenridge. And I'm like, everybody has to get your picture. Who's had their picture taken by the troll in Breckenridge? You people need to get a life, okay? I mean, that's what you're supposed to do if you live here. But the fourth thing, and our friends, the Myers, unfortunately, they did not get to experience this. But I pray every time we have visitors come see us that I want them to experience Denver, Colorado at its very best. And here's the fourth point of interest that I hope they always get to see. A little snow shoveling, okay? Not the snow, but the shovel. I'm like, here, come join me outside on my driveway as we do this. But, but here's the deal. We started a brand new series this past um, week, and we called it Points of Interest. And every time we have a destination, you, I, any of us have a trip that we want to go on, there's always certain things that you want to stop and do, right? And so whether it's the things I shared here, or maybe you have your own trip you go to, there's always these points of interest, these special stops that you feel like your destination is not complete unless you stop at these different places. And what we're doing here at South Sub Church is as we get ready for Easter, which is March 31st, mark that on your calendar, it's just in a few weeks, that we're doing this series and we're stopping every week at points of, each, at points of interest that Jesus stopped at on his way to the cross. If you look in the four different Gospels, at that last week that he lived on this earth, there were several just monumental moments that we still think of today as we think of that Holy Week. And so we're stopping and we're taking some time to study, we're taking some time to reflect, but most of all, we're taking some time for those points of interest is to really help move us in our own relationship with God. And so today, I want to take us to a very, very um, familiar, maybe one of the most famous points of interest in Jesus' life on that way to the cross. And I want to take us to the time that he sat with his disciples and he washed their feet. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to John chapter 13 and we'll start in verse 1. But that night that he gathered all of his disciples together, and we also often remember and realize, we do it in every service, that they took communion, the Lord's Supper together. But before they ever did that, Jesus took the time to wash his disciples' feet. And here's what it says in verse 1 as the Gospel of John describes this point of interest. John wrote this, before the Passover celebration, Jesus knew that his hour had come to leave this world and return to the Father. He had loved his disciples during his ministry on earth, and now he loved them to the very end. And then he goes on to write, it was time for supper, and the devil had already prompted Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew the Father had given him authority over everything, and that he had come from God and would return to God. And so verse 4. So he, meaning Jesus, so he got up from the table, he took off his robe, he wrapped a towel around his waist, and he poured water into a basin, and then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that he had around them. As you continue reading this passage, you'll know what takes place. As Jesus takes the towel and takes the water, the basin of water there, and he gets to Peter, Peter kind of objects. In fact, kind is probably not the best description. In fact, the Bible lets us know this, that Peter stood up and going, Jesus, what are you doing? What, what, what mind are you in to think that you're going to wash my feet? Because Peter knew, just like any other disciple sitting around that table at that time, that Jesus was not the right person to wash feet. That was a job that was reserved. That was a job that was designated for the servants. 
In fact, if you look back in the culture of this time and age, you would know this, that it was the lowliest of lowest jobs that would wash the people's feet when they came in. But yet it was a job that had to be done every time people came in from outside. Because you can imagine the region where they lived in was a dry, dusty region. They wore sandals, and we know that because we've all watched The Chosen, right? So they wore their sandals as they walked everywhere. But as they walked on this dry, dusty ground, when they came inside their house, their feet would have just been covered with dust and even mud if their feet had sweated at all. And so it was the custom that when they came into a home, that a servant... The lowliest of lowest jobs would stop as they walked into the house, would get a bowl of water, would get a towel, and would wipe and wash their feet. I don't know if you've ever personally been a part of a symbolic foot washing. I say symbolic because it's not a custom that we do today, but many times in church services or small groups, especially around this time of Easter, people will participate in a foot washing. It is the most awkward humiliating, strange, just event that most people will not even choose to be a part of if they have to. I mean, think about this for a second. What if I just kind of stopped the service right now and said, hey, we're going to have a foot washing. I need you to take your shoes off. And you're thinking, have I cut my toenails in the last three weeks? This may be really embarrassing. And we know this, the older we get, it just seems like our toes take on their own path, don't they? And you don't know if they're going to smell. It is just this part in our culture today that we don't really show our feet. That we don't, we don't just kind of display them for all to see. And especially when you come to church. And so you can imagine if I would stop the service right now and I would have you take your shoes off and I would walk around with a bowl of water. You're more concerned about your own feet than what I'm doing. But then as you're thinking of me, the pastor, or anybody else touching your feet, it's just a weird deal. It makes you uncomfortable. In this moment in the life of Jesus and his disciples, they weren't as uncomfortable as we would be with the foot washing because it was a part of their culture. But what was uncomfortable was Jesus doing it. Because Jesus was the rabbi. Jesus was the teacher. Jesus was the one that they were following. He was a long ways away from being the lowliest of lowest jobs. And so as you read this account in John, Peter stands up going, Jesus, hold on a second, buddy. <laughs> I mean, you can't do this. Like, you're the teacher, you're the rabbi. That's not your job to do this. And Jesus looks at Peter and says, unless I wash not just your feet, but your whole body, you can't have any part of me. And Jesus was, was symbolically saying, listen, unless I serve you, and the disciples had no idea the ultimate degree that Jesus would soon to serve them, and that's dying on the cross. But Jesus said, unless I serve you, wash your whole feet, your body, your head, everything about you, you can't have any part of me. And Peter, if you know much about him in Scripture, has a way of just kind of opening his mouth and saying things, whether they're right or wrong. Open his mouth and said, then wash all of me, Jesus. Like, I want as much of you as you have to offer, and if this is what it takes, then just wash off all of me. And then in verse 12, here's how John writes the rest of the story. He says, after washing their feet, he put on his robe again, and he sat down, and he asked a question. And Jesus said, do you understand what I was doing? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, because that's what I am. And since I your Lord and your teacher have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. At that moment, the disciples' mouth just probably kind of dropped. Because again, it's not their job to wash feet. They're following the master and they're thinking like, if he's master number one, they're gonna become master number two and three. They're kind of up the hierarchy. And he goes, and you ought to wash each other's feet. And he says, I have given you an example to follow. Now do as I have done to you. And then he goes on to say in verse 16, I tell you the truth, slaves are not greater than their master, nor is the messenger more important than the one who sends the message. Now that you know these things, God will bless you for doing them. And so in this night that Jesus spent with his disciples, one of the last moments that he would have them all in a moment that he could teach them, he needed to teach them, he wanted to teach them, he made sure that he taught them one of the most important lessons that they could ever attain from him in the three years they had spent with him. He wanted to teach them more than just with his words, but with his actions. That as his followers, they must become servants. 
because he knew in their mind, just like in every one of our minds, there's this tendency that we want to rise up. Whether it's rising up in a job that we're working at, rising up in the authority that you might try to extend in your own family, rising up in the eyes of people around you and what they think about you, there is something inside of us that we want to rise above everybody else. And what Jesus was trying to teach his disciples this day and therefore teach us is if you truly want to follow him, we must not rise up, but we must kneel down as we, as we wash feet. That we are to become servants, not masters. And as you and I begin and, and continue our journey to the resurrection celebration, as we take over these next few weeks and as we kind of begin to reflect and prepare our hearts and our minds and our lives in this whole idea of celebrating Easter together, the greatest celebration, the greatest holiday that we can even imagine celebrating together as followers of Jesus. It would be wise of us to stop long enough at this point of interest of Jesus washing his disciples' feet and not just remember the story, but to take to heart the very reason he was telling the story and living out the story, that you and I are called to be servants. In fact, if you're taking notes this morning, I want to give you just five, five truths, five applications that for you and I are servants, what it means to be a servant of Jesus. And here's the first one if you're taking notes. Serving others is a non-negotiable for followers of Jesus. Now, now keep in mind, as I'm talking about today, we reflect on Jesus serving and Jesus exemplified to his disciples what it meant to serve. He was not setting up something, uh, here's an option, like if you get to be a really good follower of me, and if you really take this whole Christianity to the nth degree, then the, like the last stage that you get in is to become a servant. No, a servant of Jesus is not some extra credit that we have. Do you remember back in school when you used to have extra credit? There were two type of people when you were taking a test at school and you had an extra credit at the bottom of the test. You had two, there were two types of people there. There were the overachievers. There were those that probably made 100 on the test, but they were such overachievers. They're looking at it going, but I want 115, I want 118. How many points that extra credit was for? You don't have to raise your hand if that's you, because most of us, that wasn't us. Most of us, when it got to the end of the test, if you're like me, the non-overachiever, I would think to myself, I wonder how many I missed and what my grade is already. And there would be this option that I would feel. There would be this thing I'm going, if I think I did, did, did good on the test, then why would I exert myself even more and do the extra credit? Or even if I didn't do so well on the test, if I know I have a good grade in the course, in the class, then why would I take the extra time to do the extra credit? In elementary school, I'd much rather just turn my page over and just start drawing on it than doing more work, Right? Somehow in our minds, as followers of Jesus today, we think serving people, serving those around us, falls under the extra credit. There was those high achiever Christians, oh, well, then I'll serve because I want to be the very best Christian I can. But for many of us, we're thinking, serving somebody else? That's going to take time? That's going to take energy? I mean, serving is not exactly what I want to do for somebody else. Someone else could serve me. And so we begin to reason in our mind, do I really need to do this? We begin to reason in our mind and somehow we think serving is an option and is a negotiable thing that we can do in our following Jesus. But here's what I want to declare for us today as we are making our way to the cross as we were remembering exactly who and what Jesus is and was in our life, then we need to remember that serving is a non-negotiable if you consider yourself a follower of Jesus. Let me give you the second truth about serving. Serving others is never or is not designed to be enjoyable. Serving others is not designed to be enjoyable. Now, let me explain what I mean by that. Now, it doesn't mean every time that we serve somebody, we should dislike it. It doesn't mean every time we serve somebody, it should be this thing that hurts us and pains us. I don't mean that. Because I believe this, as we really follow Jesus and we step in the same steps he steps into and we serve those around us, there is an inner joy that we experience because we're following Jesus. But here's what I mean when I say that serving Jesus is never intended to be enjoyable. If we only look for opportunities to serve Jesus when it's fun, 
If we only look to opportunities to serve others when I feel good because I do it, we will miss most of the opportunities that God places in front of us when it comes to serving those around us. Are you with me? This means yes. This means, Keith, do you know it's time change Sunday and I'm just good to be here. I'm not even sure I can follow you today. It's, it's not intended to be enjoyable. In fact, I think there's a specific reason, a very purposeful reason that God cho- or Jesus chose the very example of washing feet. I mean, think about this. He could have said, hey, disciples, I want y'all to sit down and I'm going to prepare the Passover meal this year. That's the way that I'm going to serve you. And he could have taught from that. He could have came in and said, hey, at the end of what we're doing today, we're going to sing a song. And it's kind of the entertainment and the going out moment. I'll take care of the entertainment for the day. He could have served them that way. There's so many ways that he could have chosen to serve the disciples in this social environment, in this religious environment that he was setting them up in. But he chose. Jesus chose probably the most undesirable way, the the least enjoyable way to serve them. Because I believe Jesus wanted to show them, I'm going to take it to such an extreme that I want you to understand, I want you to see, I want you to experience what it means to serve even when it's not enjoyable. And as followers of him, how guilty are we during the week and we see an opportunity to serve, but you go, oh, that one's going to cost me too much in my time. That one's going to cost me too much in my convenience. That one's going to cost me too much, and you fill in the blank. And we choose to put that one aside and wait for something else that will be a little bit more enjoyable, a little bit more tolerable, a little bit easier to be a part of. And so that's the second truth about when it comes to serving. Serving others is not designed to be enjoyable. Here's the third one. Serving others is not your job. It's your calling. Serving others is not your job, it's your calling. Many years ago when I was in college, my grandmother um, got really sick and we had to put her in a nursing home in a hospital. And the last days of her life, she was just in so much pain. And one of the ways that she experienced pain, she would tell us, is that her legs and her feet would just burn. So I remember one time coming home from college and I went by the hospital to visit her. And if you talk about feet and older feet that kind of went their own way. I, her, her, her toes and her feet looked more like broken twigs and, and just crooked sticks. And they just weren't the prettiest feet I'd ever seen in my life. They were feet that had been walked on for many years. They were feet that had served people for many years. They just weren't pretty feet. And her legs were swollen because some of just the water she was retaining in her. And she, just, she was just in a bad place. And we knew this, that one of the ways that some of that heat and pain that would be just temporarily relieved as she was in her last stages of life is the nurses would come in and she would ask them just to rub lotion on her legs and feet. And you've done that before, right? Here in dry Denver, if you don't put it on in the morning, you'll feel it later in the day. But just that cool moisture feels good. I remember one day I went to see her. And she called, put the nurse button to come put lotion on her feet, and the nurse didn't come. She pushed it again a few minutes later, and the nurse still didn't come. And finally, she looked at me, her 20-year-old grandson, and said, Keith, would you just rub a little lotion on my hands and feet? Or not my hands, my feet and my legs. I want you to know, there was this knot in my stomach. Because I thought to myself, ooh, grandmother, I've seen your feet. I don't want to touch those things. I've seen your legs, and I started to say, it's not my job, let's call the nurse. But I realized, this is my grandmother that had wiped my bottom when I was a little baby. This is my grandmother that when I had a paper route, rather than make me go ride my bicycle, throw the papers, she would let me put them in her car, and we would do the papers together. This is my grandmother that every Saturday when my dad and I would go over there just for her to, him to visit with her, she'd always have my donut and hot chocolate ready for me. And there's this moment as I'm thinking, it's not my job. I realized it wasn't my job, but it was my calling as her grandson to love her back. Hear me, church. 
if you wait to serve someone, whether it's a close family member or a stranger that you've just met at the moment, if you wait to serve them when it's your job, it will never happen because it's not your job. It wasn't Jesus' job to serve his disciples. He was the rabbi. He was the teacher. It was his calling as the son of God because he was about to serve them much more than washing their feet. He was going to serve them by giving his life for them. And so when as you and I begin to make our way to the celebration of the resurrection, and we do more than just look at these moments that Jesus is doing. We're stepping in and trying to live these moments of Jesus. We need to remember that when we serve those around us, we do it not because it's our job. We do it because it's our calling as a child of God. Let me give you the fourth one. Serving others is inclusive of all people. Serving others is inclusive of all people. We don't get to pick and choose those we like and dislike to serve or not serve. When we serve others, we serve people that we don't agree with. We serve people that we don't like. We serve people that we don't know. We serve people that we don't even want to be around. In fact, I'd say this far. We even serve those that we might even put in the enemy column of your life. Let's go back to who's in the room with Jesus this moment. Peter's in there. Peter's the one that stood up and said, hey, you can't wash my feet. And Jesus told him, yes, I can. I've got to wash all of you. Peter is going to end up denying Jesus three times over the next week. And Jesus knew that at the moment because he's fully man but fully God, yet he washed his feet. Who else is around that table that Jesus is washing feet? Judas Iscariot, the very one who would give him the kiss of death and would betray him over the authorities that would end up killing Jesus. And as Jesus went around that table and he had that bowl and he had the robe that was wrapped around him and he's washing feet, can you imagine what's going through his mind that moment that he steps down and he kneels down and he's washing the feet of Judas Iscariot? Fully human, he's going, man, I don't want to wash his feet. Fully God, he says, but this is who I'm dying for also. I'm not dying for the leaven over there and I'm not, and, and, and not even thinking about Judas. Jesus died on the cross to forgive Judas's sins as much as he died on the cross to forgive any of our sins. So Jesus' sacrifice, Jesus' love, Jesus' serving was never one that he would pick and choose he was doing it for. He was including every single person a part of it. In fact, I'm going to throw something out at you. Those that have been attending the last couple of months, remember before this when we had the series over reconciliation? I believe this, that serving someone can be the greatest step towards reconciliation. Because when we serve somebody, it tenders our heart and softens our heart for all the things that we're holding inside. And when you're washing someone's feet, when you're serving somebody, when you're giving for them, it also softens their heart as well. And so I think serving can be one of the greatest steps towards reconciliation. Let me give you the fifth one, and we'll end today with this one. As we're talking about these truths that comes about serving, and if Jesus is calling us to serve just like he served, here's the fifth one. Serving others is an act that comes with a blessing. Serving others is an act that comes with a blessing. When John was accounting, writing all this down, and we read the verse, but let me read it for you again. In John chapter 13, verse 17, this is what he said. And Jesus, looking at all of his disciples, after he washed their feet, he's kind of wrapping up this moment, and he says, now that you know these things, God will bless you for doing them. Not that we run around serving people so we can get blessed. We run around serving people because Jesus did, and we want to follow the actions of Jesus. But when we follow the actions of Jesus in God's economy, he has set it up and he's going, and when you serve people, there is a blessing that you'll receive. Now, I'm not promising that blessing is going to be that your income tax is double this year. I'm not going to promise you that the blessing will be that you never get another flat tire the rest of your life. The blessing might be that you step into the path and life of Jesus in such a way that you experience his presence in your life in a way that you've never experienced before. I'll take that over a flat tire any day of the year. 
And so the Bible doesn't tell us what kind of blessing, but it tells us when we serve others, there will be a blessing in our life. You know, I was thinking about this as we took our friends, the Myers, around to the different points of interest. One of the things they said is like, wow, you get to live here? Took them driving back by the foothills, and we took their little grandson and, and um, Jamila's son. We took them to see all the deer, and we counted all the deer in Ken Carroll last night. And there was like 33 deer, and he's like, wow, you get to live here? This afternoon, we're going to take them to go see the buffalo, and he's going to say, wow, you get to live here? And we get the beautiful sunset, and the sun was out yesterday, and they're like, wow, you get to live here? And I have to admit for you, Denise and I, just being here barely a year, we still pinch ourselves sometimes going, wow, we get to live here? But I wonder in three years or five years or ten years after we've lived here that long time, will we still pinch ourselves and going, wow, you get to live here? Or do the sunsets just kind of fade off and we don't seem as vivid anymore? Does the wildlife that we just happen to see in this area, does it just become more of a nuisance that you have to drive slow so to make sure you don't hit it if it runs out in front of you? Does the beautiful garden of the gods become just some tourist attraction too far down the road and we don't want to drive there to go see it? I wonder if these things just kind of become more just get lost in the every moment of life. That would be sad, wouldn't it? Can I tell you something even sadder? that we allow the points of interest that we see in Scripture as Jesus is walking to the cross, if we just allow those to become these things that we don't sense and feel and appreciate any longer. Church, as I share this story with you, the washing of the feet, it's one of the most common stories in this season of life, in this season of our calendar year. But we'd all probably confess at times we've heard the story of Jesus washing feet and it's just another one of those childhood stories that we've heard for so many years that there's no longer a wow factor. And this morning, what I hope when you leave here is that your wow has been reawoken. That this moment that Jesus knelt down at his disciples' feet and can we add a 13th disciple and just put ourselves in there? Because if we were living and alive and with them at that time, we would have been one that he would have knelt down and he washed our feet. But even more than the disciple that might have been there washed our feet, we were ones that when he died on the cross and someone said, how much do you love them? And he spreads out his arms as he takes his last breath. And he says, I love them this much. I will serve them even unto my death. And church, here's my hope and here's my prayer is that our wow factor inside of us will be reawoken. And as we take these last couple of weeks to celebrate the resurrection, it's more than just an Easter Sunday that we'll celebrate. We'll celebrate the very fact that Jesus served us and we get to serve others because of that. Do you realize this? That it's our serving one another. It's serving the people around us that may be the clearest picture of Jesus that they'll see. Now, here in a few weeks, every church in America is going to celebrate Easter. And they're going to roll out the stops. We're going to have some beautiful services here. Our 9 o'clock service will be the contemporary. 11 o'clock will still be traditional. But it's going to be some amazing services. And the room will be full of people that come on Easter. It's just going to be a great time. But sometimes Easter is not even the best picture of Jesus. Because people that come once or twice a year, they just see all the pretty things of Jesus and they don't really experience Jesus and who he is. So my challenge to you, my challenge to myself, is that as we take the journey to the cross with Jesus over these next few weeks, that we will show them, that we will give them, that we will exemplify for them the best picture of Jesus. And that is of us serving them. Can you imagine if we all just committed that over these next few weeks? Can you imagine if we put ourselves to the side and we said, I am here for those around me? I think we'd probably celebrate the resurrection before Easter Sunday because people are seeing that clear picture of Jesus. And so, church, my invitation to you is, will you serve with me as we serve others? Will you pray with me? 
Father, thank you. Thank you for giving just a beautiful example to us through your son, Jesus. Jesus, thank you, not for just telling us how to live, but you lived it out vividly. And my prayer for us, your people, God, is that today that we would return the wow factor of you, Jesus, the ultimate servant. And that wow factor may just, not just that we step back and just say wow, but may on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and every day we live out the wow. So, Father, would you help us to be servants like your son, Jesus? And we pray this in your name. Amen.